It's time now for To Your Health on AM 1420 KGNB, an informative look at the world of medicine and technology. Now, here's your host, Ron Friesenon. Good morning. It is time once again for To Your Health. This is our weekly look into the world of health and medicine. And on this morning's edition of the show, we're going to be talking about back pain and the management of that back pain. My guest is Dr. Urban Sani. Dr. Sani is a fellowship-trained spine surgeon whose minimally invasive spine surgery practice includes offices both in New Braunfels and Seguin. Dr. Sani is a graduate of Baylor University and the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Dr. Sani did his orthopedic residency with the Baylor College of Medicine. During that time, Dr. Sani worked at some seven hospitals in the Houston area, including the Texas Children's Hospital, MD Anderson Cancer Center, and the Veterans Administration Hospital. After completing his orthopedic residency, Dr. Sani continued his training at the Baylor College of Medicine in the Texas Medical Center and completed his fellowship in spinal surgery. It was during this time he learned many of the principles of minimally invasive spinal surgery. In 2003, Dr. Sani and his wife moved to this area and began his practicing opening offices both in New Braunfels and Seguin. And it's a pleasure to have you back on the show, Dr. Sani. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to be on the show. It has been a few years since we had you last. And I suspect, given the way that uh, the spine practice and spine industry has, has gone, there have probably been many changes over the course of the last five or six years in the treatment of spine afflictions, correct? There absolutely has. I think there's been some further uh, advancement and development in the area of minimally invasive surgery, but my practice specifically has taken a, 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 a turn for the better, in my opinion. Um, I now have a pain management doctor who works with me, Dr. Carl Zars, who does medical pain management as well as interventional pain management. I've also got a nurse practitioner, uh, Dr. Greg Nelson, who's also a chiropractor, although he primarily practices as a nurse practitioner in our practice. But, you know, we've uh, rebranded ourselves as the Spine Center of Texas, spinecenterofTexas.com. And we've really focused on trying to treat people um, non-surgically, which I've always made a, a serious effort to do that, of course, but I think we even take that a step further, and we've even gone to the point now where we discuss things like nutrition, um, uh, removing toxins from your from your diet, um, the importance of exercise, and spending more time actually discussing these things uh, with the patients, and and um, and we actually try to incorporate those things in, into our own lives so we can really testify to the patients uh, of, the, of the importance. And so, uh, rather than, I think think the big change is I was more reactive and really treating disease after it had occurred. We're now trying to encourage people to prevent that disease from, incur from occurring to begin with. And, and interestingly enough, we actually have a hospital now in the New Braunfels area, which is a bit of an of a experimental laboratory, if you will, named Resolute, which also has taken the same um, tactic, which is very interesting. Um, and they really have focused on, and then we could talk about that, that hospital a little bit if you want, but they've really done things that are very different than other hospitals in terms of the food they serve and the, and the way they uh, approach preventative medicine, which made me very excited and, and why I've, I got involved with them. One of the interesting things that I, that I've always, uh, thought when you're dealing with back pain is there's so many potential sources. It could be a ligament problem, a muscle problem, a bone problem, a disc problem. So I guess one of the, the things you as a physician have to do, first of all, is try and figure out what the problem is before you can either treat the underlying cause or try to work up some preventative measures as to how to stop it from happening, correct? Absolutely. And, and, you know, and when you read what we call a differential diagnosis, and that means all possibilities, essentially, for back pain, it can seem infinite. Uh, you know, it can be different types of cancer. It can be infection. Uh, you know, there's a lot. It can be kidney stones uh, that mimic back pain and other things in the abdomen that mimic back pain. But for the majority of people, it really is actually pretty simple. It may not seem simple to uh, the average person, and it's not. But when it comes down to it, it's really a handful of general causes that we're able to treat. And, and 
in the majority of cases, treat minimally invasive with interventional pain procedures that just involve having a needle placed in your back as opposed to having an open surgery. And we always strive to treat people non-surgically. And of course, if they need surgery, they need surgery. But, you know, our and our patients know this because we discuss this with them. I, I think I talk more people out of surgery than into surgery uh, on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, we that that's exactly right. And if you want to discuss some of those different causes, I'd be happy to do that. Well, I was curious, is, is a lot of the the problem people have with their back the result of just uh, degeneration a person getting older or is it uh, perhaps not using the back and the spine muscles that the way they should or can you can you generalize as to how most lower back problems initiate it, it is both of those things and certainly you know we'll, we'll get past this there's certainly cases of acute trauma where someone develops a back problem acutely but by far the majority of what we see is a degenerative process just like some people get arthritis in their hips some people get arthritis in their knees people will get arthritis literally arthritis in the joints of their back these are called facet joints because they have a surface kind of like a diamond or a facet Um, and that's where the real true quote-unquote degenerative or osteoarthritis comes from as opposed to an immune type arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis that's arthritis of aging osteoarthritis but then you can also have what's called degenerative disc disease and a lot of doctors will refer to that as arthritis but it's technically not really an arthritis it's a um, loss of youth if you will of the discs or shock absorbers between the bones and your back and a lot of that has to do with some basic science changes some changes in the proteins and the ability of your discs to hold water so think of it as your ability of your tires to stay inflated and so those discs have difficulty staying inflated due to chronic or aging processes that occur within the disc which is very complicated but the basic concept is pretty simple as the tire deflates the bones get closer together that can certainly cause back pain in the case of what we call discogenic pain or pain caused by a disc in the back but as those bones get closer together nerves can also be pinched and cause sciatica or radiculopathy or a pinched nerve would be the the layman's term sending pain down the leg so the cushioning material is being either reduced or in some cases eliminated correct how, how does a herniated disc fit into that picture so a herniated disc now that's something that that generally is not uh, or is certainly more acute or associated with people that are younger okay so although a herniated disc certainly can can occur over time that's something we think of being a, a bit more short term as opposed to the arthritis that occurs in your back or the degeneration in your discs over decades essentially but to keep it simple you have an outer covering of your disc called the Uh, annulus fibrosis and let's just call that the leather covering and you have the center of the disc called the nucleus pulposus and let's just call that the crab meat because in surgery it literally looks like crab meat and when you get a herniated disc either the crab meat the 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 leather the way God designed us there's a certain spot posterior laterally that means the back side out in the lateral portion where that leather covering is the thinnest for whatever reason we were just made that way and that's where typically the crab meat or the center of the disc will push through so it can either just cause a bulge with the leather covering intact and that can cause mechanical compression just like me taking a pair of pliers and squeezing your nerve or the disc can tear and interestingly the leather covering the annulus fibrosis the leather covering is inert it generally doesn't cause pain otherwise we'd all be walking around with pain but the nucleus pulposus or the crab meat is filled with something called cytokines and cytokines are normal inflammatory mediators that are completely normal in fact an example of a cytokine is il1 and that's what causes fever cause and that's that's part of the infl- and it's all you know it's it's all part of the inflammation and healing process but when these when these chemicals that are intended to stay inside the crab meat inside the leather covering escape they can actually irritate the nerve as well so you can get a combination of mechanical compression uh, and chemical irritation of the nerve or a combination of both and that's where uh, a lot of times the interventional treatments come in handy because they don't really need physical decompression of a pair of pliers squeezing the nerve they need to cool off that 
uh, irritation and they just sort of get their function back. And that's a lot of times where chronic pain comes in. Chronic pain can create a, a feedback loop that feeds on itself and doesn't necessarily have to do with the initial irritant anymore, but just the way the nervous system is wired and the person can just keep having pain and it can keep building, building upon itself and inside that feedback loop to keep it simple. I think I kept it simple. I don't know. I I think you did. I I even understood it. (laughs) Dr. Urban Sani, my guest, Dr. Sani is a spine surgeon. His practice here in New Braunfels in Seguin is the spine surgeon? Spine Center of Texas. Spine Center of Texas. Texas. com, And we've got a ton of videos. Um, um, that explain, Dr. Zars and I both, explain the procedures that we do. So we use that to educate our patients, and we actually get a lot of people finding us now on, on through our website and through Google searches, et cetera, and they really like the videos. And, and people are, are always interested in finding out more. Can you give us that website? Yeah, it's SpineCenterOfTexas.com, SpineCenterOfTexas.com. Very easy to find. You, you, when you were, you were talking about uh, injuries and, and spinal problems and lower back pain it sounded like if if a person that came into your office that might be age 50 or younger as opposed to somebody 50 and older that the age in and of itself might give you some indication as to the the type of problem whether it's an arthritis related or perhaps an activity related is that correct i mean is there sort of a distinction between ages and the type of uh, back problems you see absolutely absolutely and again when you're much more likely to have a pure herniated disc especially in a traumatic situation in a younger person by the time we get into our fifth and sixth and seventh decades most certainly it's it there can be a herniated disc and there often is when we see these on mris these bulging discs But it's usually a combination of things. It's a combination of these facet joints that I was talking about. Think of them as like knuckle joints in the hand. And when your knuckles get big, they don't just grow a spike out in one direction. They get overall bigger. And these facet joints grow uh, like a, from a pea to a grape, if you will. They're not as small as a pea, but I'm using an analogy. They go from smaller to bigger, uh, and, they're, and they, go, they grow in volume. And so not only do they grow out, which doesn't really cause much problem, but they grow in towards the nerves, and they can compress the nerves. So typically in an older person, you'll get a combination of nerve root compression, if it's a, the case of pain down the leg, like a pinched nerve, not just from a herniated disc, but you're kind of getting hit from all sides. And then to ma- not to make it too much more complicated, but then there's a ligament in your back called the ligamentum flavum, which in Latin means yellow ligament. And in response to these degenerative changes, it gets thicker and that doesn't help anything either. So now this poor nerve, which is trying to exit through this doorway, the doorway has become extremely small from disc ligamentum and bone spurs and and typically an older person whereas in a younger person it is unlikely it's unusual to have the the thicker ligamentum and the larger facet joint because that's more of a time related thing it's usually just a pure herniated disc so it sounds like in an older person a lot of the problems usually have an end result of pressure being placed on a nerve and in 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 those situations creating the pain or discomfort. Is that correct? That is very possible. You can get what's called lumbar stenosis, which can put pressure on nerves. More noted when the person's trying to walk, they can get to the point where they can only walk 50 feet before they have to sit and rest, or they can get just a single nerve root being pinched as it goes out that door. But a lot of what older people get is just purely back pain, axial back pain without a whole lot of nerve pain. And that's where the facets uh, come in. And there's actually a very interesting way that we can treat people who have back pain from arthritis in those joints. And it's very common. We see it just so much of it, I can't even tell you how much you know, we see on a daily basis. Talk about that a little bit, since it is something that's apparently relatively common. So if you if, if you just want to try to figure out right now in your own home whether you likely have pain from facets, if you bend over, if typically facet pain is going to be in, in older people, but certainly can happen in younger people as well, it generally hurts more to lean back because you're compressing those knuckle joints as you lean back and you're forcing them against each other. If that's painful or you're tender, not right in the middle, the midline of your back, but just a a couple of inches off to the side on the left or the right or both for that matter, then you probably have some facet pain and you've got pain from those those arthritic joints. And I and I do see this in young people. Usually it's more of a acute irritation uh, that can become, again, chronic pain like we talked about. But generally that facet pain is going to be more in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and, and, and on. So what we do is something called a medial branch block. 
Um, historically, we did these things called facet blocks, but evidence-based medicine has shown us that something called a medial branch block is more scientific. And what the medial branch is, to keep it simple, is it's the tiny little branch of the nerve, not the nerve that you walk with or pee with or you know do anything important with, but it's just a sensory nerve just to that joint. And so what we do is we use an x-ray camera to locate that joint, and we place a small amount of local anesthetic, and we numb up the nerve that supplies that joint. Now, that's not a permanent fix. It's absolutely temporary, and it's a test. Think of it as a test. But if we inject you, and for that time period, depending on the length of the anesthetic that we use, it could be anywhere from an hour to a few hours. If your pain is gone, if you can lean back and press back there and your pain goes from, say, an eight to a zero, then that implies that your facet joints are causing your pain. And this is extremely common. We, we actually do that twice because once you've done that on two separate occasions and the pain goes away on two separate occasions, from a statistical standpoint, it's almost absolutely coming from those facet joints. Then another needle procedure done in the office with you know minimal anesthesia and minimal recovery, you literally walk out 30 minutes. We can then put a special needle hooked up to a very special machine that will burn those nerves. And now this is no longer a test or a temporary uh, fix. This is called radio frequency ablation or RFA as it's normally as it's typically called. And this can actually burn those nerves and they sometimes are sore for a couple of weeks as the nerves are sort of scabbing up and dying. But once those nerves go away, um, you either have a big reduction in the back pain or a complete reduction in the back pain. And this is a much, much better way to deal with that pain than fusion. And a lot of people have gotten fusion for, for, for facet pain. There's lots of different procedures described for that. And if you can get the fact fact that the joints themselves are arthritic is not really a big deal. Now, if your back's unstable and the joints aren't functioning properly from a stability standpoint, that might need, that might uh, require surgery. But it's much, much less invasive to have an RFA than it is to have screws put in your back for that same problem. And these nerves are sensory nerves, so they're not really affecting any other function. That they don't do doing. anything but supply pain to those joints and that's it so when you burn them you don't affect any and, that, and that's the biggest question you're going to burn my nerves that's the question and i've got to go through that with patients routinely but when you tell them you're going to burn their nerves they think they're going to be paralyzed or they're not going to be able to walk or sure. they're not going to be able to urinate absolutely not and the machine we use is an extremely expensive machine this rfa unit and it has certain checks and balances to help us prevent from burning the wrong nerves and it, it it's very very high tech if you will and it's a minimally invasive treatment for a very common cause of back pain. Once you, you utilize the burning procedure, is that something that, that's permanent or will those nerves regenerate? That's a great question. So if you read the literature, they'll say that the nerves can grow back in about 12 to 18 months. We've actually had people even grow back in nine to 10 months. And so my theory, my speculation, it's not really speculation, I believe it, um, is that in a younger, healthier person who has the capacity to regenerate nerves is probably more likely to have a recurrence of the pain, whereas an older person who has less capacity to regenerate probably will have a more permanent burn. But generally, when you do that second burn, they don't come back. So sometimes it takes, a, if you will, a touch-up a year or a year and a half later. Um, and, and so, yeah, that that is a... And we, do, we don't see it a lot. I, I don't know the exact numbers, uh, but we do have people that certainly have to come back for repeat RFA. But they generally, if they responded the first time you know so we've identified the correct problem then they usually respond just fine the second time and and have a good result and if you're able to get a a, a year's worth of relief uh, it's certainly worth it coming back to absolutely the cost is astronomically less than having a spinal fusion the cost to your life lost days of work uh, I mean, you know there's no comparison it's it's a it's minimally invasive uh, and it's absolutely the way to go if that's what's appropriate for you uh, if that's the appropriate treatment but you certainly wouldn't want to not have that offered to you and instead go straight to a fusion when something like that would have made you better. I certainly would have, and I certainly wouldn't allow my family member or someone I cared about or my patients that, of course, I care about not to at least explore that option when it's appropriate. Dr. Irvin Sani, my guest, is spinal surgeon. Dr. Sani, I like we have uh, about five or six minutes left in the show, and i like just for you maybe to touch a little bit on the state of spinal surgery. I, I, I mean, Years and years ago, if somebody said he or she was about to have back surgery, uh, the thinking there was that person was going to be out for six to eight months and even after that probably not able to function the way they did prior to the problem. 
what is it like now as far as uh, the invasiveness of the surgery, the recovery period, things like that? Well, I think there's a lot of different levels for this, so I'll try to discuss them separately. Um, I think that the patient expectations, how fast we push the patient, the pain medications that we use, the type of re- rehabilitation that we use, makes even the old style spine surgery recover more quickly. We used to believe people had to, we used to believe laying in bed was good for you or that was very necessary. And I'm talking 50 years ago and that was absolutely the worst thing that you can do. So once we realized it was okay to get out of bed and we were, and we started to push people from that standpoint, that made a big difference. And so I'd say that was the first big difference. I should be very clear that in many cases, the old style non minimally invasive surgery is still very appropriate. And quite frankly, 95% of surgeons are still doing the old style because the minimally invasive is a, 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 a bit more or quite a bit more technically difficult. And in many cases, it's not appropriate for a patient to have a minimally, a minimally invasive surgery, but when minimally invasive surgery is appropriate and often, and it often is, especially in younger people, then what we're doing, the big difference is instead of burning the muscles off of the bone, you literally make a big, in some cases, 12 inch incision down the middle of their back and peeling those muscles all the way out to the transverse processes. We are splitting the muscles. And a lot of times the pain I think that I see for even a year after having an open surgery like that is from those muscles, just trying to recover. They're stunned from it being peeled away from the bone. I now can use a plane between muscles. I actually, if it's a, if a, if it's not a long fusion, certainly scolia can be done minimally invasive. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, and I, I think that that's probably a surgery that still needs to be done open to really do it to do to get a good correction. But you know, maybe someone who does more. I don't do a lot of. I don't do scoliosis surgery, um, and so maybe we we would be better off talking to somebody about that. But I think by far the majority of people do that open. But when you're talking about a one level or a two level fusion, which is very common, and that's primarily what I do. I try very hard to limit the number of levels. I'm not a big believer in you know fusing someone from their neck to their butt, and and those patients typically um, don't do well at all. Um, but when it's a, when the patient's appropriate, I can split the muscles. And so they're not, they're not burned off. They're not, uh, burned away from the bone. I'm literally going in between muscle planes. I have very little blood loss. I just did a surgery at resolute here recently where I did a two level lumbar fusion in a relatively, and not a small person. Okay. They weren't a huge person, but they certainly weren't a small person. They would have at least gotten a a 10 or 12 inch incision and an open procedure. They probably easily, and depending on what I found in there and how big the bleeders were, could have easily lost a couple of liters of blood. That patient lost 200 cc's of blood and her incisions were one and three quarter inches. Um, I was able to put in instrumentation on both sides and, and she is, I just uh, saw her just a, you know, a couple days post-op and she's up walking around and her leg pain's gone. Um, a lot less recovery. She doesn't have, uh, you know, the blood loss. She doesn't end up with a uh, transfusion, and I expect her to recover much faster. It doesn't mean that every minimally invasive person is going to hop out of bed one hour after surgery, but I can tell you that if they had an open surgery, they would recover more slowly. You know, everyone's everyone's pain tolerance is different, but we were able to successfully decompress her and put inner body cages, put cages between her bones, which classically you'd have to cut some someone from their belly or from their side, there's something called the X-lift or lateral approach now, and then go to the backside. So they end up with at least two incisions. And now I'm able to do that both successfully through two levels through a less than two inch incision. It's, you know, I don't think I'm going to be able to get my incisions or anybody's going to be able to get their incisions any smaller than that. There's, you got to have some room to work, but it's amazing. The blood loss, the speed of the surgery and what you're able to do through very small incisions. And it starts the healing and rehab process so much quicker. They re, they rehab so much faster. I had one patient that I did a single level on and she had what's called a slip, which typically uh, people would say that a minimally invasive surgery maybe shouldn't be done for a slip because it's just so difficult, but her slip wasn't bad. And I was able to successfully treat her one level. She was up walking two hours after surgery and her, and she was off pain medication completely in two weeks. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen with everybody, of course. Um, but she was a extraordinary patient and she even, she even impressed me with her speed of recovery. But again, I was able to do her surgery again through a less than two inch incision I, on her. I lost 50 cc's of blood, um, which is less than a tooth tube of toothpaste. And for spine surgery, that's really almost, that's very, very, very sure. little. Um, and, you know, again, split her muscles and she was up walking two hours after surgery, which is very unusual for having a fusion. I'm talking to Dr. Urban's honey. We have uh, about two minutes left in the show. 
You mentioned at the start of the show that your practice is beginning to incorporate other things, including diet, uh, other issues, and sort of a, a total look at uh, uh, spine problems and lower back problems. Talk about that. Some of, talk about some of the other modalities, some of the other things that you're trying to bring into the practice to treat people with spine problems. So, you know, I, at this point, I'm not pushing supplements or anything like that. I'm a big believer. And if you want to go to GNC and buy a couple of supplements, uh, I have no problem with that. I'm not knocking supplements, of course. But I really believe in some very basic principles of getting away from CrossFit. First of all, being overweight puts unnecessary stress across your back. I tell people all the time, I say, if I give you a 100-pound sack of cement to carry around, don't you think your back's going to hurt more than if I don't? And so if you're carrying around this extra weight, that's certainly putting stress across your back. And it's really bad for you in just so many other ways, from diabetes to heart disease, et cetera, um, carrying around that extra belly fat. And so we really talk to people about, and this is probably a whole other show, but I believe very strongly in intermittent fasting, something called intermittent fasting. Um, and it, it has its whole, uh, a whole list of physiology. But rather than get into that, I would say what's very important, the first thing you can do if you're a patient is just to get away from the toxic foods. I really believe that a lot of the food we eat today is very toxic. Things from McDonald's, things with preservatives. And, you know, and, and this is controversial, but GMO, you know, uh, non-grass-fed beef, and, and you don't even have to take it that far, but just, you know, the simple thing that I try to do if I'm trying to lose weight or I'm trying to detoxify is go back to raw and green. I do a lot of juicing. And so I just talk to people about getting the right building blocks into their body and getting the right number of calories into their body. And it really doesn't take any sort of special supplement. It doesn't take any sort of special diet program that you can buy off television. I think those things in some way or pills, that's really what I don't recommend if you can avoid it is taking pills that suppress your appetite. Because the problem is when you stop taking those pills, which you ultimately will have to do it, then you have no plan. You don't have any education. You haven't taken the time or the, you know, you don't expect to be a good surfer unless you go out and practice surfing. You don't expect to be a good tennis player unless you go out and play tennis. And eating and diet and nutrition are the same way. It's an, it's an evolution. You've got to learn your own body. But, you know, the first step is just to quit putting the poisons in your body, which are, in my opinion, sodas, fast foods, processed foods, um, and things. And again, this is a whole show that we could talk about, but these are really the basic things that I encourage the patient to do. Uh, a lot of patients will tell me, I can't lose weight because I'm in pain. I can't exercise. Well, I lost some weight myself. Uh, I got overweight and let my life get out of control um, about a little over a year ago. And so I did my own experiment and I lost 50 pounds, not exercising at all. And I use what's called intermittent fasting. And we could talk about that sometime. Um, and a lot of, and I actually got blood work before and after, and I saw some amazing changes uh, that occurred with that type of uh, eating pattern. Um, and it is, it is controversial. Um, uh, but I certainly would be happy to come back and discuss it sometime. But you know, things that that to me is for me, it works great for me. And it's extremely healthy. It makes my mind clear, it gives me more energy, and I'm able to lose weight without using uh, any sort of uh, pharmaceutical medication. And we will certainly bring that up on a future show right now. However, we are out of time for today's show. Dr. Urban Sani, my guest. Again, the name of your practice? SpineCenterOfTexas.com. And we've got myself, Urban Sani, Dr. Carl Zars, and uh, Dr. Greg Nelson. Dr. Sani, always a pleasure. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you very much. That's going to do it for this edition of To Your Health. You're listening to AM 1420 KGNB New Braunfels.